Amen. That's right. That's, that's a good verse. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Good verse. Good verse. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And while you're turning there, I'd like to acknowledge a visitor that we have with us this morning. It's so good to have Alex and Carrie Kibitza with us. And that's them right here on this side. Praise Amen. the Lord. So happy to have the Kibitzas with us this morning. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. So good to have you guys with us. And may the Lord bless you. Uh, for being with us today. And so members of the church, make sure you stop by and shake their hands and let them feel welcome uh, here at Calvary Baptist Church. We're so glad to have them. So glad to see everyone in church this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'll, I'll be preaching from verses 9 and 10, but let me, let me go to the beginning of the context. Let's go to verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Very familiar passage of scripture. If, if you're not familiar with it, you need to underline or mark these verses in your Bible because in verses 1 through 4, we find the Bible definition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is amazing how many people that are religious, how many folks that go to all kinds of different churches that could not give you a, an, an accurate description or definition of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. And so, but here is, here is the definition, the official Bible definition of it right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read it, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Now the word saved means to be delivered. And in Romans chapter 5, verse number 9, I believe it is, Paul the Apostle says that we need to be saved from the wrath to come. And we'll uh, discuss that perhaps a little more in the message. But if you're not saved this morning, the Bible teaches us, as we're going to see later, that God's wrath is currently upon you. Now that's a very serious situation and condition to be in. But I've got good news for you, and the word gospel means good news. If you're if you can recognize that you're a sinner and if you can recognize your true spiritual condition, we've got good news for you. Jesus Christ can save your soul today. Amen. He can save you. And, uh, but if you do get saved, it'll be through this gospel. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now here's the definition of the gospel. Verse 3 and 4, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Notice, here's the gospel definition. It is how Christ died for your sins. Now many will say that the, the definition of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that's correct, but it is a little bit deeper than that it's not only the fact that Jesus Christ died, because one of these days we're all going to die. Right. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So what's the difference between his death and ours? What makes his death so special? Well, what makes the death of Jesus Christ so special is the fact that he died voluntarily. Jesus didn't have to die. We have to die, and the reason why we will die one day is because we're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so because we're sinners, there are consequences for our sins. And one of the consequences for our sins is death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But in the case of Jesus Christ, Jesus never sinned. Jesus is the only man that walked upon this sin-cursed earth and was sinlessly perfect. Amen. So when Jesus died on the cross, he did it willingly. Jesus chose to die. You and I don't have a choice in the matter. You're going to die one day, and that's why it's so important that you make sure you get saved because you don't know when that's going to happen, but it is going to happen. And when you die, you're either going to lift up your eyes, like the Bible says in Luke 16, either in heaven or in hell. And so there's a hell, there's a heaven to gain, 
and there is a hell to avoid. And the only way to escape the damnation of hell is by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why his death was so important. Jesus Christ offered his life as a sacrifice for your sins. Now, there's a whole lot of information uh, that I don't have the time to divulge into to, to explain what all that means. But just understand this much. Jesus Christ gave his life willingly on the cross of Calvary so that you might be saved from the, the penalty of your sin, which will be hell forever if you don't get saved. Jesus Christ loves you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not perish, but should have ever, everlasting life. Listen, there's no reason in the world why you should perish if you'll recognize that you're the sinner Christ came to save. Right. Jesus Christ said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in order for you to be saved, you must recognize that you are a lost sinner on your way to a devil's hell. Right. And if you can at least recognize that much, you're, 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 you're on track. Because once you recognize uh, your true spiritual condition, and we're going to try to get into it in just a minute to explain what the true spiritual condition of a lost individual is. But if you can recognize that, then you'll be able to recognize what the need is for salvation, why you need to be saved. One of the reasons why so many people don't get saved is because they don't realize the need for it. They think that everything is okay. We're here to tell you this morning, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, everything is not okay. I don't care if you've got all kinds of money in the bank. I don't care if you drive the nicest car and you live in the nicest house. I don't care if you have a six to seven figure income. I don't care if you have the best job you, and you're living the dream. I don't care if you're living the American dream or whatever dream, dreams are that you live. Let me tell you something. Your dreams are going to turn into a nightmare as soon as you take your last breath if you don't get saved. You need to get saved, and you need to do it today. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So quit procrastinating. Tomorrow is not the time to do it. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Amen. Do it right now. Today, Jesus will save your soul. Today, Jesus will wash away all of your sins in that divine, precious, incorruptible blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. Amen. He'll forgive you of your sins and he'll wash your iniquities away forever in his own blood if you'll let him save you today. Amen. So this is the gospel that we preach. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, verse 4, and that he rose again the third day. Jesus Christ rose again. One of the little... One of the little boys uh, for, uh, right after Sunday school came up to me and, and said, Jesus rose again. I said, he sure did. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's what you need your children. You want your children to know that, hey, listen, we don't serve a dead Savior. Hey, the grave is still empty. Buddha's still in the grave. Muhammad's still in the grave. Every religious leader, uh, they're all still in the grave. And the ones that live today, they're all on their way to the grave. But Jesus Christ, three days late, later, he rose from the dead, declaring and demonstrating to the whole world that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. Amen. So praise the Lord. We serve a risen Savior. And he lives in our hearts. Amen. He lives in your heart if you're saved today, and he'll live in your heart as well if you'll let him save you. So this is the gospel that we preach. But now when you get to verse number five, the apostle Paul begins to present evidence to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of the evidence, evidences that he presents is the evidence of eyewitnesses. He says, we know that he rose again from the dead because we saw him. Many of us saw him after he rose again. And so you're never going to convince us that he didn't raise from the dead when we stare at him eyeball to eyeball. We saw it with our own eyes that Jesus Christ, he lives. And so in verse number five, he goes on to say and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and that he was seen above, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom, that's a lot of eyewitnesses. 
I mean, if you're trying to, if you go to court and you're trying to demonstrate your case and you've got over 500 witnesses to verify your side of the story, that's a pretty strong statement. And so verse 6 says, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me, also as of one born out of due time. And let me say this, I've never seen Jesus Christ with the physical eye, but I, let me tell you something, I've seen him with the spiritual eye because I've seen the work that he's done in my life. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your religion is. You are never going to convince me that Jesus is not real. I've experienced too much of his goodness and too much of his grace and too much of his power in my life to deny his presence. Jesus is real. Jesus lives. And if you'll trust him as your savior, he'll save you today as well. Amen. And he'll work in your life like no one else, like, like no one else can. And so he says in verse number, number nine, now notice this. I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul said about himself. And here, here we come to the message. Verse 9. I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And that's true. Before Paul got saved, Paul killed Christians. He would hunt them down. As a matter of fact, the, the, the day that he got saved back in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to arrest Christians so that he could bring him back to Jerusalem and have them condemned. When they stoned Stephen, a mighty man of God, a leader in the church of Jerusalem, when they stoned Stephen, he was the one holding on to the coats of all the ones that were stoning him. And the Bible says consenting unto his death. In other words, he, he expressed his favor. In other words, kill him. And yet Jesus saved this murderer. But I tell you what, I've met murderers that have been saved. I'm about to go to Mexico. I'll never forget down in Matamoros, Mexico. I met an ex-drug cartel member who was an assassin. Who to, Not only is he, is he saved by the grace of God, but today is the Baptist of a fundamental independent Baptist church just like this one. What am I trying to say? I don't care who you are, and I don't care what you've done. You're, listen, uh, where sin doth, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. If you'll repent of the sinner that you are, let me tell you something. Jesus will forgive you of your sins, and He can change your life as well. Amen. Boy, that's wonderful. God saved Paul, but He says in verse number nine, He says, "I'm not. I am the least of the apostles. I'm an apostle, but I'm the I'm the worst one. I'm the least of them all." I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle, even though that's exactly what I am. I want to talk to you a little bit about the humility of Paul this morning. He says, I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church, verse 10, but by the grace of God. Thank God for his marvelous grace. Amen. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, well, he's not what he used to be. He used to be a murderer. He used to be religious, but lost. What is he now? Now he's saved by the grace of God. I am, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I'd like to preach to you this morning on the subject, what the Apostle Paul thought about himself. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be in church this morning. What a blessing, Lord. You've blessed us with a beautiful day, Lord. And so we have tried our best this morning to take advantage of this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we recognize that you are worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory. I pray, Father, that through this message even, you would be glorified. I pray, Lord, more, most of all, that you be glorified in our lives and through our lives. Now, Lord, as we consider the life of your servant, the Apostle Paul, I pray that we can learn from him some things that we ought to apply to our lives, that we might be better Christians for your honor and for your glory. But then I pray, Lord, Lord for anyone under the sound of my voice that may not be saved today, that may not know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior, I pray that today would be the day that you would open their eyes, that today would be the day that they would allow you 
to do the work that only God can do in the heart of a man or of a woman. Oh God, send Holy Ghost conviction and save sinners. May the saints be edified. But most of all, may Jesus Christ be exalted and may you be glorified. Give me the grace and the words to speak and we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, this would be a very foolish thing to do. The Bible says it's foolish to compare yourselves with others. Don't do that. That's a big waste of time. But if we were to have a discussion on who was the greatest Christian to ever live, if we were to have that conversation, you would have to throw Paul's name into that mix. I'm sure that perhaps the strongest argument, or at least one of the strongest arguments would be made on behalf of the Apostle Paul. If we were to make a list, who do you think would be, you know, the the pound for pound (laughs) greatest Christian that ever lived? We would have to consider the Apostle Paul. You could perhaps throw some other names in there, some other worthy names, but I'm telling you, you would make a, I think it wouldn't be very difficult to make a very compelling and convincing argument on behalf of the Apostle Paul being perhaps the greatest Christian that ever lived. But if you were to ask the Apostle Paul about that, you know what he would tell you? He would tell you the total opposite. He would tell you what we just read right here. He said, listen, when it comes to all of the apostles, I'm the least of them all. We see Paul's humility. Now, I want to explain something to you. And I've explained this before, and I want to explain it again. There is a difference between humility and low self-esteem. We want to learn humility. But um, when we speak of humility, we're not talking about having a less uh, uh, or, or, or a, lower, a low self-esteem. That's not what we're talking about. Low self-esteem is when you think less of yourself than what you are. Humility is when you think nothing of yourself. In other words, I'm just taking myself totally out of the equation. It's not about me. It's only about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because look, when it comes to self-esteem, we're not denying that you're not smart. I tell my kids all the time, look, you're not dummies. Because if you're a dummy, then what am I saying about myself? (laughs) We're not denying that you're not smart. We're not denying that you don't have intelligence, that you don't know some things. All I'm saying is that you don't know what me and mommy knows just yet. There's some things we know about that you don't know about. But you will one day when you have your own kids. Then you'll understand some things. But we're not saying you're dummies because you don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. So this thing about humility and low self-esteem. Look, uh, if, if, you have, uh, if you have some things to, that the Lord, some ways that the Lord has blessed you, some abilities that the Lord has blessed you. Look, don't be proud about it, uh, but use those things to bring honor and glory to the Lord. So we're not telling anyone to deny what they are. Look, at, at the end of the day, uh, I, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't deserve it. I feel the same way Paul did, but God did call me to be the pastor. So you know what? If that's what God's will is, then I'll just accept it. But at the end of the day, I know that I don't even deserve to be a Christian. At the end of the day, I understand that if I got what I really deserve, I'd be in hell this morning with my back broke like the old timers used to say. But I'm so thankful that one day back in November of 1988, God showed me what my true spiritual condition was. And even though I was just a little boy, I knew enough to know that I was a lost sinner on my way to a devil's hell. And I got on my face in my bedroom and called on the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. And God did. And I've been saved ever since. And I give all the glory to God. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve the least of God's blessings. But I'm so thankful that God saved me, that God birthed me into the family of God. And not only is that, not only did he wash all of my sins away, but as as if that wasn't good enough, he allows me the great privilege that I don't deserve, but the wonderful honor to get to serve the King of glory. Hey, listen, what an honor it is to serve and represent the King of glory. You know what humility does? It gives all the credit to the grace of God. I'm not saved because of my efforts. I'm saved because of the grace of God. 
I'm not a Christian because of my efforts. I'm a Christian because of the grace of God that works within me, that pushes me onward, that motivates me, that inspires me, and that causes me to do Christian things so that I can be a Christian. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God working in my life, I would not do Christian things. I would do selfish things. I would rather do carnal, fleshly things. But there's something on the inside that says, talk this way instead of that way. Look at this instead of look at that. Listen to this instead of listen to that. Behave this way instead of that way. You know what? That's the grace of God working in my life. And I'm so thankful for it because otherwise I'd be more of a mess than I already am. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And when you get to thinking about what Paul the Apostle was, we're talking about somebody that perhaps was the greatest Christian that ever lived. What a great man of God. From our perspective, this man, we don't deny, how can we deny his greatness? He wrote, thir listen, the Apostle Paul is the author of 13 books. There's only 66 of them in the whole Bible. And Paul wrote 13 of them. Now, that, that's some, I tell you what, that's, that's a pretty big point to put on your resume. How many of you can put on your resume? I wrote 13 books in the Holy Bible. That's Paul's resume, and that's just one of the things on his resume. We're talking about the first man that, that was ever called of God to be, the, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, he's not the first apostle. The original disciples that walked with the Lord Jesus Christ here on the earth during his uh, uh, time in uh, ministry, they were disciples to the Jews. But Paul was the first man that was exclusively called to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone else that was not a Jew. That's a great honor. Amen. And that's a great task and responsibility. But that was the responsibility. That was the purpose that God gave to the apostle Paul. That's a big deal. I mean, we're talking about a man, my brethren, this man presented the gospel before dignitaries. This man presented the gospel before world leaders, before governors, before important people, governors, kings, like King Agrippa, for example. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is a man that presented the gospel to a Caesar of Rome, an emperor. How many of us can say that we've witnessed to an emperor? <laughs> The apostle Paul, Paul presented a gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ to a Caesar of Rome. That's a big, that's a great accomplishment. Yeah. What a great man of God was the apostle Paul. And, and just think about the abilities that we have. I just got done mentioning, you know, if you've got some talents, some gifts, and some abilities, thank God for that. You ought to use those things to bring glory to the Lord and to be a blessing to others. But you know what kind of abilities that the apostle Paul possessed? He had the ability to heal people. He had the ability to raise men from the dead. How many of you have done that before? I never did. Never even tried. Not going to. Uh, uh, Paul the Apostle. I'll never forget one time. Someone called, called me. They wanted me to exercise a demon. You know what I did? I called the cops. <laughs> Haul this guy out of here. I never took that course in the Bible Institute that I graduated from. But Paul the Apostle was a man, hey, he had the ability to do some supernatural things that you and I will never get to do. He had what they called the gift of tongues. Now, if you go to a charismatic church, they'll tell you, they'll tell you a different version of the gift of tongues than the one that you find in the Word of God. But in the Bible, what the gift of tongues was, was the supernatural ability to start speaking in languages that you never learned. For example, I'm bilingual. I served as a missionary uh, in the Spanish-speaking world for over a decade. And as a matter of fact, this week, I'm going to go down to the heart of Mexico and preach a meeting, and I'm going to be doing all my preaching in Spanish. So I know English, and I know some Spanish. I tried to learn a third language, an Indian dialect called Guarani, when I was down in Paraguay, and I never got to complete. But I can speak two languages, okay? The Apostle Paul, here's the thing. If I had the gift of tongues, however, do you know how difficult it was to learn a second language? I didn't grow up with Spanish. I was born in New York. You Southerners are going to have to forgive me for that. I didn't do that on purpose. But to make up for it, I did grow up in the South. 
There you go. And so I had to learn Spanish just like any other American missionary has to learn whatever language of whatever foreign country that the Lord sends them to. And you know how difficult it is? It took me a good year before I, can, before I could do something halfway decent in the Spanish language. But if I had the gift of tongues, I would have never have had to study nothing. If you have the gift of tongues, even though you don't know one word of Cantonese. Now, Cantonese is what they speak in China. Am I correct? How many of you speak Cantonese in here? But if you don't know Cantonese, if you were to go to China tomorrow, if you got on a plane and went to China tomorrow to preach the gospel to, to folks in China, now you better be careful, that, that's illegal over there. But if you were to do that, if you had the gift of tongues, as soon as you opened your mouth to preach the gospel, out of your mouth would come the gospel of Jesus Christ in Chinese or in Cantonese, even though you don't know a word of Cantonese. That's a supernatural gift that God gave the apostles. Why? Because he gave them a tall task, which was to preach the gospel to every creature. Well, guess what? Every creature doesn't speak the same language as you. So how are you going to fulfill the Great Commission if you can't communicate in the languages of everyone else? Well, that's why God gave those apostles the gift of tongues. And so in Acts chapter 2, all kinds of folks from all kinds of different lands where they learned and spoke different languages would go to Jerusalem to, to worship. And on the day of Pentecost, which was one of uh, Jerusalem's uh, holy days, uh, they took advantage of that opportunity to witness to folks that spoke languages from all, other, all kinds of other countries. And 3,000 people got saved the first day. Amen. That's amazing. And what I'm saying is this. You and I don't have these kind of abilities. But Paul the Apostle had that kind of ability. What a great man of God was the Apostle Paul. And yet despite all of his greatness, despite all of his abilities and talents and gifts that were given him from God, despite all of his great accomplishments that we could go on and on and on about, you know what Paul the Apostle said about himself? He said, I'm the least of all the Apostles. If I'm anything, and if I can do anything, it's only by the grace of God. Amen. Let me explain to you how Paul, what Paul thought about himself. You want to know what Paul thought about himself as a sinner? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. What did Paul the apostle think of himself as a sinner? Now the Bible says that all have sinned and come short. Of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, John said in 1 John chapter 1 that if you try to say that you don't have sin, you're deceiving yourself. Uh, yep. I actually talked to a man one time that told me I haven't sinned in over 30 years. I said, You messed up just now. <laughs> just lied. You're deceiving yourself if you don't think that you're a sinner. You are a dirty, rotten sinner just like me and just like everybody else. So join the club. Right. Yep. Because until you join this club, you can't get saved. Why should anybody get saved? If You know what salvation is? It's a deliverance from sin. And so if you don't even recognize you're a sinner, you don't need salvation. And that's why so many folks are not seeking the Lord because they think that they're better than what they really are. And my goal this morning is to show you that you're not as good as you think you are. Neither am I and neither is anyone else. We are all sinners. And without God, we are helpless and hopeless but God can help you and in God there's hope Amen. but look at first Timothy chapter number one first Timothy chapter number one look at verse 15 what did Paul think about himself this great man of God this great minister one of the greatest Christians if not the greatest that ever lived look at what he thought of himself as a sinner first Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners notice of whom I am chief. Right. You know what Paul the Apostle thought of himself as a sinner? He said, I'm the worst sinner of them all. And let me explain something to you. Until you gain that perspective about yourself, you are never going to be a true born again child of God. Right. We're talking about one of the greatest men that ever lived. What was his attitude about himself? He said, I am the worst. When he says, I'm the chiefest of them all, what does that mean? I'm the chief? What that means is, I'm the worst one. I am the number one worst sinner. 
that ever lived. That was his attitude about himself. And you know what? Until you see yourself as worse than everyone else, you're never going to get anywhere spiritually in your, in your relationship that you ought to have with God. You're never going to, God is never going to be able to help you the way that he can help you until you have the right perspective about yourself. But the problem is because too many of us are too proud, we, our pride prohibits us from seeing our true spiritual condition. The problem with sinners is that sinners continue to try to justify themselves. They may even admit, well, look, okay, we're all sinners. Everybody's a sinner. Everyone has issues. No one's perfect. But I'm not necessarily a bad person. No, you're wrong. You are. You are very, very, very bad. Paul the Apostle said, matter of fact, I'm the worst one of them all. But, but, I mean, you know, uh, I, 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 may, I may have messed up and I've made some mistakes in life and I've made some errors. I mean, we all make errors, but I still have a good heart. No, you don't. You have a dark, black, wicked, vile, perverted, ungodly, corrupt heart that only God can fix. And until you see that, you're never going to get the help from God that you need. Paul said, I'm the worst sinner. I'm the chiefest of them all. And that was the key to his greatness. You'll never get to do anything great in the eyes of God until you get the right perspective of yourself. Until you realize, you know what? I'm such a mess, I can't do anything great because I, I, just, I would just mess it up. And you know what? When God sees some, someone that has that kind of an attitude, he says to himself, now there's someone I can work with because I can work through that individual and accomplish great things and he'll allow me to get all the glory that only belongs to me. But he can't work with you when you're full of proud pridefulness and you're over here just justifying yourself. Uh, I know I messed up. I've made my mistakes like everyone else. But listen, I'm not really a bad person. I'm not as bad as those people. Now, those guys over there, they're really something else. No, 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 no. You've got the wrong perspective. Until you see yourself worse than all of those people you despise and think are the worst people in the world, your God is never going to do the work that he desires to do in your life. Right. You're the chiefest of sinners. What is the spiritual condition of an unconverted man? I don't have time to look at all the verses, but in Luke chapter 15, verse 4, the Bible says you're lost. We say he's a lost man or she's a lost woman. What does that mean? You're going through life with no direction. Where exactly are you headed in life? So many people walk through this life and they have no purpose. They wake up in the morning, drink their coffee, eat their breakfast, put on their clothes, Put on their deodorant, I hope. Go down to the job site. Do their eight or nine hours or however long it is. Come home, eat dinner. Maybe they watch TV. And then they go to bed. They wake up the next morning. Repeat the same process. On the weekend, maybe they'll do something recreational. But then the next week, it's right back at the same thing. And you know what? They just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Making the same mistakes over and over again. And you know what? They live life with no true purpose. What exactly is your purpose? Because let me explain something to you. If you'd ever get saved, you would find out that God has a purpose for your life. It's called the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, according to Romans chapter 12. Hey, God can do amazing things in your life. God can do wonderful things in your life above and beyond your furthest imaginations. But until you get your heart right with God and get the right perspective about yourself and your real condition and who and what you really are, God is never going to be able to help you like he can. You're lost. You're going through this life with no true direction in your life. You try to direct your own life, and all you do is just wind up falling in a ditch over and over and over again. You want to know why? Because you're trying to do life without God, without his will, without his grace. And I'm here to tell you that that's a futile effort. You're just going to keep messing up if you keep trying to do life without God and his mercy in your life. What is the condition of a lost man? Look at John chapter 3. What is the condition of a sinner? Paul said about himself, he said, hey, I'm the worst of them all. Do you really see yourself as the worst one? 
Here's the problem. We justify ourselves by comparing ourselves with everyone else. But that's, a, that's self-deception. You're delusional. You're delusional when you do that. And when you compare yourself with others, all you're doing is feeding your self-delusion. And you create in your mind, in your vain imagination, a version of yourself that's not really true. Because you lie to yourself when you don't do things God's way. So you have to force yourself and make yourself think that you're something that you're not. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, He that thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing deceiveth himself. You're delusional. You're going through life and you don't really have any real purpose. And the reason why you don't really have any real purpose is because you refuse to put your life in God's hands 100%. And if you would do that, you would find out God's got more purpose for your life than you can even handle. But you'll never get to live life the way God intended for your life to be full of purpose and bliss and joy and peace and contentment and satisfaction in your heart. You're never going to have that if you keep going on in your pride and in your delusions. What is the condition of of the unconverted? Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse number 19. He said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in John chapter 19. John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, look at verse number 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds, notice, were evil. When's the last time you saw the things that you do as evil? And you know what? That's why you're never going to get the help and the grace That God offers until you realize just how evil your ways, your deeds, your actions, and your thoughts are. The problem is your pride blinds you. Your rebellion blinds you. So you walk through life delusional. And Jesus Christ, this is is Jesus talking here. Jesus knew what he was talking about. But the problem with sinful man is we're so full of arrogance, we think we know better than Jesus about ourselves. You do not know better about yourself than Jesus. He knows more about you than you'll ever know about yourself. He created you. Look at what the Bible says. He says, verse 20, Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That's why folks don't go to church. They're not going to go to church and hear a preacher open a Bible and talk to them like this. Who are you to talk to me like this? You put your pants on the same way I do. I know. And you know what? You need God just as much as I do, and I need God just as much as you do. What did Paul think of himself as a sinner? Hey, Jesus Christ says, those that are, that are unconverted, you're living in spiritual darkness. Everything around you is spiritual darkness. Darkness. That's why things keep getting worse and worse and worse for you. You know why? You're like that little cartoon character with the black cloud over his head everywhere that he goes. And that black, that black cloud is never, it's never, ever going to go away until you get your heart right with God. Amen. What is your condition? Your, look at what Ephesians chapter 2 says. Oh, listen to me. I want to help you. I want to help you this morning. And more than anything else, God wants to help you. And God can help you. But he cannot help you if you continue to go on deceiving yourself. Living a life of delusion. God wants to open your eyes to the truth. But he can't open your eyes to the truth that can save you and change your life when you can't even face the truth about yourself first. Ephesians chapter number 2. Look at what the Bible says in verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no, notice, having no hope without God, without Jesus in your life, having no hope without God in the world. If you don't have God living on the inside, you are hopeless. Now, when Jesus Christ, there's always hope. But outside of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. 
You are hopeless. You can deceive everyone in the whole wide world into thinking that everything is okay with you. But God sees what's really going on and God knows what's really going on in the backside of your heart. He knows the real you that you're doing. So you're, you'll do the best that you can to hide from everyone else. Let me tell you something. You can hide from everyone else, but you will not hide from God. He knows the real you. And the truth about the real you is this. If you're not saved, your life is hopeless without God. But if you let God save you, there's, there's more hope than you can even handle. You know what your condition is if you're lost? Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Romans chapter 6. So many folks are blinded to what their real condition in life is. This is your real condition if you're not converted. Romans chapter 6, verse number 17. The Bible says, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered you. You know what your spiritual condition is? If you've never been truly converted by the grace of God, you are a slave. You are a slave to your sins and your passions. You can try to try to, you can try to fix them your own way. You can try to fix your problems without God through your own ways of philosophizing and justifying yourself and comparing yourself with everyone else. And you can come up with your own methods to try to clean your act up to where it at least appears good enough in the eyes of everyone else. But let me explain something to you. Deep down in your heart is a darkness and a passion that only the light, which is Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light of the world, can ever clear up and outside of the light of the world which is Jesus Christ you are hopeless and you are a slave to sin you have chains and shackles upon you and you're never going to be freed from your ungodly passions and ungodly desires and ungodly lust and the things that you do that you think that nobody knows about but God knows all about it you're never going to be freed from those things until you let Jesus Christ save you and you get washed in the blood of the lamb what are you? Look at Romans chapter 5. Paul said, you want to know what I think about myself? This is the greatest man that ever lived. And yet, you know what he thought about himself? He said, I'm the worst sinner of them all. You, that's the perspective you need to have about yourself. Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 10. For if, if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we were saved. We shall be saved by his life. You want to know what your true condition is if you've never been converted? You are the enemy of God. What are you trying to say, brother Manny? You're trying to say I'm bad like Hitler? I'm bad like Mussolini? I'm bad. Those, surely those guys were enemies of God. Look at the horrific things that they did. I never killed six million Jews like Hitler did. Those are the true enemies, right? Until you see that you're worse than them, you're never going to get saved. Hey, listen, what if you're right? What if all, in all your efforts to compare yourself with everyone else and in all of your efforts to justify your, your wrongdoings, what if you were right and you're really not as bad? You're really not as bad as everyone else. You're not right, but let's just for sake of argument say that you are. You're not as bad as everyone else. What difference does it make if you die unconverted, you're going to go to the same hell as everyone else that you think that you're better than? You're going to burn forever in hell, fire, and brimstone right alongside every Adolf Hitler and every evil, wicked man that ever lived. So what difference? Listen, all of your comparing of yourself with everyone else and all of your efforts to justify yourselves, they will do you absolutely no good in eternity. I'm trying to help you this morning. What is your condition? Ephesians chapter 2. I wish we didn't have to talk like this as preachers. I wish we could just be nice and just have a civil conversation. But the problem is, folks are so full of pride and so full of rebellion, they have to have someone wake them up and, and shake them up and get them to face the reality that they refuse to face about themselves. 
And you know what? And it still doesn't work many times. We can preach till we're blue in the face and folks will go on and it'll just roll off them like water off a duck's back while they go right back out into that same darkness, uh, can, trying their best to justify themselves all the way to a lake of fire. And it's sad. It's sad, but I tell you what, there is hope for you if you can get your eyes open, open, if you would let God, if you could swallow your pride long enough to see what your real condition is, I promise you, God can not only open your eyes, God can transform your life and change your life and make it to be better than you ever thought that it could be. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you at the quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins. You know what your condition is if you're lost? You're dead. You're a walking dead man. On the, in, on the outside, you can have a smile on your face. You can be as bubbly as you can in your personality. You can be outgoing. You can, you can look like you have life just vibrant all over you. But on the inside, you know that you're dead. Well, even if you don't know it, you're still dead. The Bible says, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You can go down to the club and dance the night away. You can smoke all the dope that you want and smoke all the marijuana and smoke all the whatever it is that you like to smoke and justify it because, you know, it's the herb from the earth and God created all of this as well. Yeah, God created a lot of stuff. Uh, he created hemlock too, but you shouldn't drink it. And you can go on and on justifying yourself and trying to convince yourself that you're not as bad as what you really are. But you know what? While you go on in your pleasures, trying the best you can to fulfill that hole that is within you that can only be satisfied by the grace of God. Inside your life is a shape, is a hole that is shaped in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. And only the Lord Jesus Christ can fill it. But you keep going through life in the darkness of this life, trying to fill it with drugs, or maybe it's alcohol or maybe it's sex, fornication, immorality maybe it's perversion maybe you try to fill it up with religion you try to fill it up by trying to convince everyone you're a good person hey, folks try to fill it up with money the love of money and riches and being successful in life and a nice car and materialism there's all kinds of ways that folks are trying to fill that hole, that void that is in their life but I'm here to tell you it's the biggest waste of time because all those things are going to do is 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 is, is is cause you to become numb to the preaching of God's word that God will send your way to try to shake you up to reality and open your eyes and all those things you're trying to fill that void in your life with is just going to numb you all the way to hell. Right. The Bible says in John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. What's the true condition of a lost man that is not truly converted? Oh, listen to me. Listen to me. Please listen. He that hath ears, let him hear. If you can take this, and if you can take advantage of it, and if you can let God open up your eyes to the truth of yourself, you don't even realize that salvation lieth at the door. God can do wonderful things in your life. But you are your own worst enemy. You're the one holding God back from doing the beautiful things that he's capable of doing in your life. But you keep trying to fix things on your own and all it does is just get worse and worse and worse. John chapter number 3. Look at verse number 18. John chapter number 3 verse 18. And this is the condemnation. Well, uh, look at verse number Look at verse 36, John chapter 3. Look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son uh, shall not see life. But notice, the wrath of God will abide on him. Is that what your King James Bible says? It says, but the wrath of God abideth. Present tense. You know what that means? If you're not saved, while you sit there in that pew, unconverted, you're just as good as in hell right now. I take no pleasure in saying that. I almost preached on hell this morning. I avoid preaching on hell. You know why? Because I like to, I'm, I try to, I'm a positive kind of guy. I'm Mr. Positive. But there's nothing positive about hell. 
There was a godly old black preacher in Louisiana. He had a radio show that he would preach on. And man, he would let it rip. He'd preach hellfire and brimstone, you know, back in, like they used to preach, old school. And someone called in the show and, and, and was complaining, you, you never preach nothing positive. Everything you preach is always so negative. When are you going to preach something positive for once? And he said, okay, tune into the show next week, and I promise you I'm going to preach something positive, finally. So the next week came around, and he said, everyone's been complaining that I'm not a positive preacher, and I'm always being negative. So today, I'm going to, for the first time, I'm going to preach a positive message. The title of the message today is, Why I'm Positive, If You Don't Get Saved, You're Going Straight to Hell. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you don't get your heart right with God, you're going to go to hell, and you're going to burn forever. You young people better listen to me. If you're not saved and your decision in life is I'm going to go on and do my own thing, as soon as I get the chance to get out of the, this, the, the roof of mommy and daddy, I'm going to finally have the freedom to do what I really want to do and I'm not going to let them bunch of them crazy preachers that, like Brother Manny, that, them people are crazy. I, I read somewhere on social media, this guy's crazy. If that's your decision, you're going to go through life and do your own thing as soon as you can get out from mommy and daddy, as soon as you can get away from that church and all that hellfire and brimstone and all that Bible thumping. Let me give you some advice. Hug your mommy and daddy. If they're saved, hug them while you can. Be just as kind as you possibly can and establish the best relationship as you possibly can this side of the grave. Because let me tell you something, when you die, and you will die one day, and it could be tomorrow and it could be today. But when you're in hell, you ain't never seeing your parents again. And that's the decision you made. You say, oh, Brother Manny, you're trying to play on my emotions. It's the truth. If your parents are saved and you're not, guess what? They go to heaven, you go to hell. And then let me flip it. There's some parents that have saved children. And their children have been trying for years and years to try to get their parents to open their eyes. But you know how it is. The older you get, the more hard and stubborn you get. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Old Fogey, Mrs. Old Fogey, keep going on in your old stubborn ways. But your stubborn ways, your rebellion and stubbornness and pride is going to land you in a lake of fire and there'll be no escape. Yeah. Right. You're not arguing your way out of that. Listen, God didn't make hell for you. God did not make hell for you. You know who he made it for? He made it for the devil. He made it for those demons that are fallen angels. That's who he made hell for. What he made for you is paradise. The problem is to be with God, you have to be saved. Right. And if your decision is, I don't want to be saved, I don't want to be a Christian. Well, you can't go live with God if that's your decision. You cannot, see, the problem with people, they're so delusional. They want to live life their own way. I don't want God. I don't want the Bible. I don't want the will of God. I want to do things my way. But I still want all the blessings of God in my life. Sorry, you can't have it. Find your own way to bless yourself and make it as good as you possibly can because it's not going to last forever because when you die, it's over with. You're going to hell and there'll be nothing you can do to satisfy yourself there. So make the most of it if that's your decision. But I'm here to tell you, if you're willing to, get your, to let God open your eyes to your true lost condition and realize, you know what? Not only am I a sinner, I'm the worst one. Amen. You see, so many folks, they, I'm, I'm not even going to church because church is so full of hypocrites. Mm -hmm. And they don't even realize, you know what? You're the biggest hypocrite of them all. All this talk about judge not, judge not. We shouldn't be judging one another. Meanwhile, you judge everyone in the church. I'm not going to any church. They're all full of hypocrites. I've told you this illustration before, and I'll probably tell it a hundred times. But what if you do have dirt on us? Hey, there ain't no perfect people that come to my church. If you're looking for a perfect church, I'm sorry, this is not it. Sorry. Maybe there's one down the road. But if, if there is... I wouldn't suggest you go there either because as soon as you show up, you're going to ruin that perfect church. Right. So don't go here and don't go there either. 
But no, we're happy to have you here. But here's the thing. What if you do have dirt on us? I've got dirt on the preacher. I know what Brother Manny really is like. I know what his wife and what his children are really like. I know what them people down at that church is. Okay, what if you do? Because here's the thing. I'll be the first to admit it. Hey, none of us, we're, we're all a mess. Right. Are you not listening to what I'm preaching this morning? Paul said, I'm the chiefest of them all. But here's the thing. You may know one or two or three things about me. But if you would take a good, honest look at yourself in the mirror, I guarantee you, you find out that there's more than one, two, or three things wrong with you. You may have dirt on me, but you don't have all the dirt on me. But if you're honest with yourself, you'll see all the dirt on you. And if you can get your eyes open enough to see just how dirty you are. See, the problem is the reason why you can't see it is because you're so busy trying to see everyone else's dirt and you don't even see that you're the filthiest one of them all. Until you get that perspective about yourself, God is never going to be able to do the work that he's capable of doing in your heart. Paul, you know what he said, said about himself? I don't have time to get into the second and third points. I'm going to have to close. But you know what Paul thought of himself as a saint? Look at Ephesians chapter 3. We got to close. Ephesians chapter 3. What Paul thought of himself as a sinner. What Paul thought of himself as a saint. Because he was saved. But even as a saved man, he didn't think of himself so hot. One of the greatest Christians, perhaps the greatest Christian that ever lived. You know what Paul said about himself in Ephesians 3? Please look at this. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, look at verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, unsearchable riches of Christ. Are you kidding me? Paul, you are perhaps the greatest Christian that ever lived. You know what his attitude of, of himself was? As a sinner, I'm the chiefest one. I'm the worst one. As a saved person, I'm less than the least of all the saints. We see the humility of Paul as a saved man. Paul referred to himself in Philippians chapter 4 as vile. Paul referred to himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 later in the chapter as corruptible. And let me explain something to you, dear child of God. Thank God for your salvation. If you're saved, praise the Lord. But may I remind you, your flesh, that carcass that you live in, is just as filthy and stinky and rotten and wicked Today as it was the day before you got saved. The day before I got saved, I liked fried chicken, and I liked pizza, and I liked tacos, and I liked chocolate ice cream. And guess what? The day after I got saved, I still liked pizza. We just had some yesterday. And ice cream, and fried chicken, and all that stuff. You know why? Because when you got saved, the appetites of your flesh did not change. That's why as a saved individual, you have to be like Paul and remain humble. You have to crucify this flesh. You say, well, then, Brother Manny, then what's the difference between a saved person and a lost person? The difference is this. When we got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside. Amen. So now that I'm saved, I have a choice. You see, before I was saved, I didn't have this choice. I didn't have this option. I was a slave to my sin. But ever since Jesus set me free, now I have a choice. Freedom. Amen. What is that choice? I can either live according to the appetites of this flesh that I used to be a slave to, or I could crucify the flesh and walk in the spirit, and the fruit of the spirit will be love, joy, peace, and all kinds of good stuff. And that's the choice you have every day as a Christian. But you're never going to crucify the flesh and you're never going to walk in the spirit and you're never going to have victory over the things that you desire to have victory over in your life until you have the same humble attitude of the Apostle Paul. I am less than the least of all the saints. Amen. Christians get to compare themselves with others as well. That's where jealousy and envy and all this kind of stuff and controversy and strife comes from. Quit comparing yourself with everyone else. Just concentrate on your own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's plenty to work with right there. Amen. 
And then let me say this in closing. What did Paul think of himself? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What did Paul think of himself as a servant? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're done. We're done. We've got to close. I went longer than I intended. I would almost apologize, but I get to thinking about how long are the movies you like to watch, and, and I change my mind from apologizing. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 5. The Apostle Paul said, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Look at verse 7. Here's what Paul thought of himself as a servant. That, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I'm so thankful that God allows us to participate in the work of the Lord. What a privilege. What an honor. You ought to take advantage of it. And if you're not taking advantage of it, today would be a good day to start. There's plenty of room for you in the service of the Lord. But let me explain something to you. If we do get anything accomplished, it's all for the glory of God. At the end of the day, some plant and some even water. But if God doesn't do the part that only God can do, sinners will never get saved. If God doesn't do the part that only God can do, listen, you can have the best pastor in the whole wide world that knows all the deepest profound doctrines and you can have the best Christians and you can have the greatest choir and you can have the most dynamic song leader and you can have the best song leaders we can have the best of the best and we can have all the resources and all the money in the bank we can have everything that a church could possibly desire but if God doesn't do the work that only he can do let me tell you something all of our efforts will be in vain and so that's the reason why instead of getting prideful and high and mighty, we need to get on our faces before God and beg God to go, Lord, please do the work that only you can do. I'll do the best I can to be faithful, to do my part, to be a good father and a good mother and a good husband and a, and a good wife and a good witness and a good Christian. But God, only you are God. Please do the work that only God can do. And if we'll let God work in our lives freely, I tell you, it'll be glorious what he'll accomplish. A president, President Harry Truman said, it's amazing how much you can get accomplished if you don't care who gets the credit for it. I don't have the time. I meant to close in 2 Corinthians 12, but I must close here. But Paul the Apostle, he said, listen, he said, I don't want to be a fool in glorying in myself. He said, but I'm so careful to make sure that others don't think of me more highly than they ought to think. See, that's the difference. That's what separates true greatness from mediocrity. I don't want, Paul's attitude was, here's, a, here's the greatest Christian probably, probably the greatest Christian that ever lived. A great man of God. And you know what makes the difference between greatness and mediocrity? He says, I don't want others to think more highly than me than they ought to think. He says, if I'm going to boast about anything, even though that would be foolish, if I was to boast about anything, I'll boast about all the trials and persecutions and all the sufferings. You know why? Because God brings those things in my life to make sure that I don't think of myself more highly than I ought to think. That's the key to true greatness. Listen, if you've never been saved by the grace of God, don't leave here lost. I'm not going to give an invitation. But if you'll come and see me after service, i got to have a meeting with some of the men afterwards, but if you'll come see me, I'll assign someone to talk with you and to show you from the Bible how that you can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're saved by the grace of God, and if you're not saved, how to get saved by the grace of God. Don't leave your lost. Why don't you humble yourself? Quit lying to yourself and everyone else. Swallow that pride that's holding you back and keeping God from doing what he's capable of doing in your life. And admit, okay, God, I'm through playing games. Here's my heart. Here's my life. Now do with it what you will. You'll find out how glorious it'll be. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. Brother Sir Matt, close us in prayer, please.
thank you, Father, for your goodness in our lives, Father. We thank you for the gospel, Lord, making it so easy for us to be saved. Lord, I do pray if there's anyone here today that's just confused or doesn't understand or needs a little bit more help, Father, I pray that you wouldn't let them leave this building without getting that taken care of. We just thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.